All right, let's try this again. Hello, tell your friends, tell everybody what's going on. All right, because I had to restart, because I think that there was some interweb issues. So I'm gonna be going live today with, hold up, I wanna make sure I get her last name right. Julissa Contreras, Contreras. Yes, we're gonna be talking about the moment, expanding on the moment, expanding on healing in this moment. All right, so she's a Dominicana from the Bronx, creator of YouTube hit Shit Spanish Girls Say, yes, and creator of Ladies Who Bronche podcast. She's a writer, poet, actor, and founding member of the Middle Voice Theater Company. She's gonna give us her perspective and some, some wisdom in this moment, through this moment. Um, I'm gonna see, let's see if she's on right now, hold up. We're gonna try to reconnect. Here we go. Is this working? There we go. There we go. Much better, I think. But yeah, okay, great. Um, but yeah, what we were saying before, um, you know, the thing started acting up was like, there's a lot of learning that we are doing right now. Um, and I think that for me, a lot of things have come up. First of all, it's like you said earlier, welcome to the revolution, right? Like, I think that welcome um, to the revolution. People. in our lifetime, we've seen a lot of moments where folks get excited and we're like, all right, is this the time we're really going to transform things and band together? And, um, you know, I think that the power of our collective voice right now, for me, feels a lot louder than I've ever experienced. And so it's really like I even myself as a social justice warrior and like preparing myself to be like, all right, guys, this is this is not a fire drill this time. This time this is, it's it. actually, this, is the, this is the drill this we have the momentum to really make something happen here um and understanding that that means a lot of things it means a re-education to make sure that you know i am representing both my group as y'all can see back here yo soy dominicana right and so like understanding like that there's a a learning and an undoing that has to happen in my community and 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 holding ourselves accountable to that um and then at the same time understanding that there is a unified force that is oppressing not just my group but all groups across the board um and understanding so what is that collective voice look like and how do we stand in unison and in, in those spaces so it's a lot of learning and making sure we're coming correct and you know sometimes we're very well intentioned and stuff but we have everybody has a little bit to learn and for me like uh the more you're open to loving yourself and self-growth the more that when that learning moment pops up it might catch you by surprise you know what i mean there are often times you're like oh shit i didn't realize i was problematic you know what i mean <laughs> like i didn't with, know i mean i recently just like we were talking about yesterday this whole um the difference between abolition and reform yeah you know what i mean and even just the inherent like kind of white supremacy that i kind of had in my mind even just thinking that reform could be could be possible no matter who was promoting it you know what i mean and it's not it's not possible is what i'm learning and the more that i inundate myself in work in works of you know abolitionists since the beginning of time especially black women mm -hmm. um like i just really am just wow okay yeah no there's no such thing as reform for a, a, a system based off of white supremacy there cannot yeah. be reform in that regard so i've been very much schooled on that in the past like 24 hours even 48 hours you know because yeah. i've always believed in abolition of course but i i had this thing in my mind where it was like something that can come later on down the line when it's when it's like we've been constantly in that conversation of oh well later we'll get there maybe but it's like no now is the time to radically shift our mindset into like no what is possible what is what is the world that we can imagine and how can we grow to that world versus like what are what are the different ways we can band-aid the situation on the way there 
And I think that that's one thing that um, I think we have to identify the power that we're standing in right now, which is, you know, back in the day, there were a lot more limits to the movement. And that's not to say that we've made it to where, let's say, Dr. King or any, like any name, every, any revolutionary, like, it's not that we've already accomplished it, but um, there's, di there's a difference, right? Like even the power of recording on a cell phone, for example, right? And cap capturing stories. Um, so so like, I, I think we really have to keep our boots to the ground and understand that like, um, we might not have everything at our dis disposal to snap our fingers and just make it happen. But certainly we have more tools than the people who came before us. And we have the wisdom of what they learned, right? And I think that that's where the value is in learning our history. So for example, like when people are talking a lot about the Black Panthers right now, there are still people in our own community who think that they were a violent group, for example. Well, I mean, they were put on the terrorist watch list. So if Exactly. You were a part of like brainwashed America that was only ever getting your information and news, especially during that time specifically from that one source from like a news channel, you know, yeah. the media, whether liberal or, you know, conservative, whatever way you go with it, it's run by the same people. And they're gonna, they have a narrative, a very clear, succinct narrative that they are pushing no matter what, no matter yeah. where you get your information from. So I think that's another thing about how amazing this moment is and different this moment is is that we're keeping each other educated. We're sharing tools with one another. We're holding each other accountable in a public light, which happens yes. to be online, which doesn't need to be a physical holding of accountability, which is quite interesting, I think. Right, right. And and just like the, the floods of information that's out there, like, it's like that, and again, welcome to the revolution, the shit that we, excuse my language, I don't know if I can curse. No, please. Things. Girl, <laughs> my fans, no. <laughs> but you know, here. the way shit is going to hit the fan, and like when something impacts a fan, things splatter, right? The corners that we are going to have to explore and dismantle are going to be crazy. It's going to be a mess. It's going to be a splatter. But that is the point, is that you rebuild. And like, yeah, rebuilding means there's cracks, right? And you will inevitably inevitably see those flaws, but you have to fill that in with, with the gold and decorate those scars and say, this is what we learned, right? We have to amplify that so we understand so generations after us, right, can then level up as we have and have more tools um, because we have to be honest about our history, both internally and with the forces um, who are against us, right? Like, that is the most important thing. That. Yeah. yeah, like really looking at our history. I think that's where the dissonance comes from and why we're even arguing whether or not, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement is a valid cause for everyone to get behind or not. I think it's it's the fact that that's a debate is is thoroughly ingrained from our inability to look at the truth of our history. Yep. We were not taught the truth of our history. We were not taught the truth of um, or the, the depth of the, the pain and the shame that comes yeah. with what has been done to black people in America. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and it's like, and we've been talking about it, even the nuance of that, of Latinos and or Latinx, the Latinx community, because, you know, we try to, we want to separate ourselves from it. But in that separation, there's even a, a sort of supremacy because there are Afro Latinos like yourself. Yeah. Like yeah. that is an intersection that is very much alive and real in the United States of America, in this melting pot of cultures that come from all over the world and present in all kinds of colors, you know what I mean? Yes, yes. So there's like an intersectional battle in that overall battle for black lives, you know what I mean? Because there are black lives in all kinds of cultures besides just the, the descendants of the people who were brought here specifically as chattel, from chattel slavery and specifically for yes. the use of, uh, specifically as property, you know what I yes. mean? Yes. So there's like a, a, that's that's an even another little layer of the nuance to where we have to really dig in and heal and talk about the truth of all of the layers of the history and Absolutely. how colonialism is like ingrained in our very practices. Absolutely. And I, I think it's so important for us to think about what we were taught and think about the language uh, that was used and how things were framed. So when we were learning about how, you know, you know, we had colonizers coming to Latin America, the Caribbean, all these places, like it was framed in a way that was adventurous and necessary for the beautiful growth of what would come to be the United States of America. But it wasn't taught from the perspective of like, hey, we, we existed in these spaces and we were doing our thing. And then here comes these 
here come these groups and 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 oppress us right but the word oppression was not taught in that like in the history lesson when we were preparing for a test in history we were not using those words called oh, manifest destiny right manifest like, what, destiny what, what, what destiny use... are you manifesting by taking land from people bro exactly like, what? <laughs> Exactly. And so then uh, details get lost in that history, like, you know, depending on who, which academic you're asking, anywhere between 94 to 96% of African slaves from the slave trade were left in Latin America and the Caribbean, 90, 94 to 96%. That means there's only 4 to 6% of that lineage that came here to the United States of America, right? And that is the African American race, right? And so, you know, when, when, when we understand understand these numbers then that that has to shake you in a way so then it's like so then where did all those people go where did they disperse they didn't just stay in uh dominican republic Cuba, puerto rico by the way you know what i mean they went to other spots that's jamaica this is you know all of these I caribbean islands um there's black people in, in mexico you know what i mean like there's just there's just such a spread and it is just not the aspect with which we were we were taught but understanding that is important yeah. the more you understand that they didn't teach you that because they didn't want you to have that information the more you start to question the way in which other things have been communicated and taught to you a hundred percent we also you know in this conversation of broader to even include another layer of it is the indigenous populations and how they were yes. also enslaved and they were also kind of put into this whole melting pot of this diaspora you know we are we are a, a mix of all that is or that was colonialism you know what i mean it was these european settlers coming in and bringing in human beings and exterminating human beings from a land that already existed and that had already had their cultures so even when you know because i'm cubana americana and my grandparents both sides my mom was born there and i have you know all of that in me you know I, my ancestors are una mezcla of all of of all of the above like all of ours you know we're a diaspora of all of these things and when we talk about you know these rights and these these liberations we're talking about the liberation of our own people and i think that there's this divide when it comes to the racism that exists in the latinx communities um because there's also different layers of it and different levels of it because yes you know, in cuba and in the in the dominican republic you still have two different cultures even if we are similar you know what i mean and then when you go to south america or central america you have a whole nother range of how indigenous communities and, and 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 slave communities like all kind of mixed together and made their own valid cultures out of that and we yes. all profit off of those cultures that were yes. created by the hands of slaves and in the you know, yes. you know yes. what I mean? we are we are the amalgamation of all of those things come to light you know especially yes. white latinos who love to claim this rich culture you know hello that rich culture comes from our roots it okay. comes from the that history that of the afro the that Af 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 african influence over our cultures yes absolutely and i that's one of my favorite things is to see um how people really deny the black the black culture in the latinx community and i'm like but same platano different recipes motherfuckers because Same the platano, platano stretches very wide <laughs> and it leaves the spanish tongue okay right and mismo platano que nosotros nos gustamos mismo platano, cantar, platano. también los africanos cocinan ese platano y lo comen y nosotros lo aprendemos de eso i'm saying it in Bello, spanish this is what they're writing say it in spanish nosotros estamos Bello, hablando Bello. para lo que están gente aquí que habla en español, en español. escuchando Oye, para lo que nosotros estamos hablando es que nosotros como una comunidad no tenemos la, la educación y no porque no queremos, pero no nos dieron la educación para saber de dónde viene la, la, la familia de nosotros. Mira, mi español es, es roto, como dicen de los dominicanos. Yo hablo mi español roto, pero ¿por qué es eso? Va, hasta eso tiene una historia. Hasta ¿verdad? eso Entonces, tiene una historia. Todo eso es importante. Entonces estamos hablando que es importante de entender la historia negra entre los latinos porque no es nada más eh, la historia, vamos a suponer, en la República Dominicana que lo, ah, no, lo haitiano, que no lo queremos aquí, qué sé yo cuánto. Óyeme, nosotros en esa isla querían, querían hacer una isla negra poderosa porque nosotros somos una raza negra. Después, cuando entró Trujillo, 
que ustedes saben que ya eso fue más de 30 años de qué, enseñándote algo que no era para tu bien, pero sino para, para mantener una raza negra baja, porque están siguiéndole los pasos, así como los Estados Unidos, y si ellos están viendo que en los Estados Unidos le funciona muy bien, que los negros lo, lo, ten, lo tienen bajo y los lo americanos, tú sabes, muy arriba, entonces, ¿qué hacen? Los hace? blancos, porque también los blancos, americanos, ¿qué quiere decir? Porque te, de, si, hablamos de africano-americano como si los africanos eh, americanos serían parte se, separada de, de la cultura eh, americana, o sea, pero si los africanos americanos son los que han hecho y han creado, han creído, o han, han creado, me parece. Creado, sí. Crea, han creado la cultura yeah. americana. O sea, todo el mundo como que quiere ser africano, quieren, sí. quieren ser eso. Ok, eso es importante hablar de eso eh, entre nuestras comunidades, porque hay mucha, oh, hay mucho racismo. Yes. Y, y, y también de lo que está hablando Julissa ahora, es eso, en, es, es este, esta mentalidad de que somos separados, que, que, la historia de, de, lo, de los africanos americanos es diferente de la, de la historia de los africanos uh -huh. cubanos o, o dominicanos o latinos en general. O sea, como si esa historia es algo aparte o como si, si ellos no son parte de esa historia. Uh -huh. aunque, y aunque los africanos americanos, lo, los negros que están aquí en América, ellos vinieron por, porque como propiedad, lo querían sí, no fue No fue voluntario, ellos latinos. no sacaron visa, ellos no sacaron visa para llegar aquí, eso fue a la mala. A la exacto, puerta, exacto. Traía, ¿no? y también en eso, los latinos, nosotros cuando veníamos para acá, fue por decisión, fue porque queríamos crear una, un, una vida nueva para nuestra familia, para nuestra familiar, para nuestra generación, o para los niños. Eso porque vin vinimos nosotros desde, desde donde, que, donde sea, de, donde yeah. sea, en Sudamérica, en América Central, yeah. eh, eh, Española, lo que sea, todos veníamos a los Estados Unidos por decisión, no necesariamente porque nos trajeron acá. So, yeah. Eso es otro nivel de, de problema que tenemos que hablar, Así. porque por, por esa razón, ellos no se creen que, que nos deben algo. Yeah. No, hay, no hay ningún que yo te debo algo en, en, esa, en esa relación, porque yeah. para ellos, tú, tú tomaste la decisión de venir acá, así que si tú te, si te jodes, te jodes, Esto, eso fue tu decisión. Right. Así que los derechos de los afro latinos no, ni se habla, ni se right. habla de eso, ni se right. habla de que cuando estamos hablando de estas, estos statistics, que también tienen que ver con los afro, afro latinos y también los yep. latinos en general, Yep. Porque si te creen, si te creen diferente de ellos, te van a, te va, o sea, es la sistema, es el sistema. El sistema. Sí, sí, and I, and I, just for, just to quote, to come back in for the folks who right are back to the back, English. Like, I, I think, yeah, definitely what we're saying is that there is a way in which, um, even our, the way in which we came here, you know, Dominicans, we come here and we, we get our visas Cuban. to come to this country, but we're talking about a history of people who were enslaved and did not have a choice, right? And so, like, that basic understanding already changes the dynamics of their American experience when they get here, right? So you're talking about um, a group, and, and this comes... I'll frame this by saying, like, there's a way in which when we're having these tough conversations with each other, we have to be gentle because, like, does it piss me off every time Dominicans who are black deny their blackness? Absolutely. Like, it makes me, it makes me violent almost. I almost want to shake them and remind them, you know, of their history. But then I have to remember what? I have to remember that if it's somebody like a cousin who lives on the island, the access to information, the books that they're being taught in school, not the same as mine. Let's keep in mind that they were under dictatorship until the early 60s, which means people like my mother, you know, were, were still alive when a lot of this teaching was happening. And then years after that, the person who took power after Trujillo, Joaquin Balaguer, was a man who was his right-hand man. And so what happened was we changed the system and it wasn't a dictatorship, but it was basically like putting a Trump in office after taking out a dictator from the United States, for example. And so what happens in the rhetoric in the same way we're experiencing in America right now, um, that rhetoric was what folks were taught. And, and really it was quite wow. dangerous to, to to think anything else and to speak out. I mean, they were literally killing black people and tracking black people down. And so it was very difficult to be 
um, openly woke, right? And those, for a lot of folk where the, pri the priority was, well, I need to find food or it, can my kids go to school? I mean, we're talking about a third world country. It becomes difficult to make your identity, in any case, black or, or light skin or whatever, it makes it difficult to make your identity the priority. So then what happens in a moment when everybody is like, you this is who you are. Remember who you are. Blah, blah, blah. People are like, what are you even talking about? I've spent my life just trying to survive. What I've are spent you my life trying to distance about? myself from the part of me that makes me a target. Yes. Yes. And, and so it's like, that's a survival tactic. When people don't claim their Afrocentricness or their Afroness, you know, it's not because they want, they don't recognize that it's true because right. there are plenty of things that we are told in microaggressive form and passive aggressive form yes. in, in very direct form as a society. Okay. As a Latino community, there are many passive aggressive things or just even simple, like trying to marry lighter or trying to have yes. lighter kids or trying to, you know, clean the race and all that. Kind yes. Of and and know, being like told I've, I've heard people say, gosh, I have a list of these. I mean, like, I've heard yeah. people say things like, oh, bueno, si tú te vas a cortando con negro, aprende a hacer trenza, porque esos cabellos no son fácil. Meaning, like, oh, if you're going to be fucking a black guy, you better get ready and learn how to do braids, because that hair ain't easy, right? And, and, like, and, and, like, it's almost like a threat. It's almost like the blackness that you're associating with. You better with, not bring with. that into your situation. Yes, it is threatening your, your situation, right? It is threatening your ability to move through the world without being oppressed in a particular way, which is, again, why I'm saying it is important to be gentle because what you are combating is somebody's survival tactic more so than, the, than, than a belief system. It's just the, if I'm not going to see change in my lifetime, how do I shut down and protect myself? Because I don't believe we're ever going to have the revolution, so leave me the fuck out of it. Don't talk to me about blackness. Don't talk to me about all, any of this. And so it is a survival tactic so we have to understand that, that it's almost like you say, you're educating people and you're also saving people from from this this toxicity that one develops and it is completely natural we've all done it you know 1, I learned I was black percent. at 19 I didn't know I was black like I knew I was black but because black people were like oh no you Spanish right and I was like oh you Spanish which is actually what where my um the title for my video came from she's Spanish girl say I know the proper term is not Spanish I am not from Spain you know what I mean I know that but why did we do that because the colloquialism of New York City made it such that people were were blanketed and if you spoke Spanish you were Spanish but then I'd go into my Spanish corners y la mexicanas weren't really fucking with me you know what I mean and like what the mantecanos weren't really fucking with me and it was like hard it was diff it became difficult because they also in their own circle were like well we don't really see black people Una separación. So they started so I'm being a ping pong ball between the black community and the Latinx community and and understanding like damn but we eat the same platano like, I always go back to that. And it's such a simple thing. But I'd always be like, it is so confusing to me how we're so different. And then I learned. And then it, it was such a relief. And that's why it's important to have these conversations because people are relieved of pain when you talk about the difficult things. It's a difficult conversation, but that's part of the healing process. And healing hurts. Healing hurts. But you know, it's looking at yourself and looking at all of the spaces where you are imperfect. Yep. You know, and unfortunately, that's that's one of the biggest parts of all of this, especially, again, for the Latinx community, is that we need to look at ourselves yes. before we can, you know, co come around claiming this high and mighty energy, especially right. white Latinos, which I've noticed, like, a lot of people are, are pretty silent for the most part, white Latinos, like, yeah. very silent, actually, as if our brothers and sisters aren't trapped in cages because of ice, as if, Hello. as if our parents, my parents, you know, when, when, my grandparents first came to Miami. They were there were signs that literally said no fucking Cubans, no Cubans here, no Cubans allowed, no Cubans welcome. Right, say, right along with no Jews. You know what I mean? Like, like we, the Cuban people were refugees of a of a dictatorship. You know what I mean? Like at the end of the day, like that's what we came over as. So for me to listen to any white Cubans talk about mm -hmm. anything besides being on the side of the Black Lives Matter is just absurd to me and all of the different you know things that i've noticed all of this trauma points right back to this this need to be a model citizen because again yes. we weren't brought here we came here by choice so there is a, a, a an underlying guilt in that 
where we have to be good Americans and we better show up and show out and be Americans. And mm -hmm. America is so synonymous with racist mm -hmm. okay, that oftentimes, even when we're betraying our own communities, we are prepared to take up arms for our oppressors. Yep. Because it's not like my grandparents or my parents, even though we're white passing, had all the opportunity in the world. You know what I mean? Había una tía aquí that claimed my grandparents. So, you know, they got, they got, she helped them out a little bit when they got here, but they had to start from scratch. Yes. You know, they worked as maintenance people and, and insurance sellers and, right. and teachers, you know, we, we're, we're out here part of the middle class, the working class, you know, yeah. and granted, there's still so much privilege in that, that I've had to recognize and be, and be very mindful of in, in my whole process of growing since I was 16 yep. is that, I look like a white person walking around the world yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to, con and I'm going to get treated like a white person, whether yeah. my prima is darker than me or not. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's my experience in the world, but it's just as important for me to talk about these issues because of the Afro Latinos that exist yeah. in the world who are, uh, who are the backbone of our cultures are the, the creators of our cultures, the, the hand makers of our cultures, you yeah. know, the fabric of the music, the fabric of the, of the food and the, the, the hospitable nature and the warmth, you know, that all comes from our Afro-Latinx family, yeah. you know? Yeah. Bad so money it's can, just so important run. that when we're talking about this Black Lives Matter movement, we are talking about those lives. Those lives are part of that conversation. Yes. And they might not be the center focus of the conversation because, of course, Black American experience of those, of those who were brought here has been a very particular experience in Absolutely. history of disgusting violence, you know, like just system, systemic violence that we have to just really reckon with right now in a way that I don't think we've ever even been given the capacity to, because we're all, we got no jobs, everyone's home, everyone's fucking freaking out because of a health crisis. And we're really, re we're looking at all of the different ways already, even before this started, ha this, this came to like, again, you know, is that we were all already in a state of like, what the fuck is going on? How is, what is the government, what is government for? What is our tax yes. dollars for? Yeah. If we cannot provide personal protection equipment for our frontline workers that were right. frontline workers a second ago, but are getting arrested now as protesters. Like, right, right, right. And I always call that like, like, like people, I feel like people enter these movements at different points because people, stay unwoke until they hit their trigger limit, right? Um, or until something and, happens to them. Right, exactly, which is just that. It is either too close and it's like close enough that it's a problem or it fully happens to me and you're and you're then thrown into it, right? Um, todo el mundo este, se despierta en diferentes puntos. A veces coge que algo te pase a ti para que tú entienda lo que, que están sintiendo la otra gente. And it's, it's really... It's, it's scary because then that's what makes it difficult for us to unify is that different people are on different pages at all times. And mm -hmm. I think that um, you're absolutely right. Having coronavirus ha put people in a state of reflection, right? Because while it absolutely did disproportionately affect communities of color, as most things do, and we had to see that, we also had to see communities that usually hold a lot of privilege have to really maneuver things around to be able to have that privilege in a time where the universe was like this is bigger than your money and what you can usually use as a resource so Ooh. now we have folks who are who are itching with that and we're still in the virus actually like we're in these streets again but the virus is still here and so now what we're starting to see is is people feeling the pressure of the anger and saying holy shit well if i don't change something I'm getting canceled or there's going to be a shift. Like people are feeling the pressure of that shift because we're angrier, we're hungrier for the change because we've just been sitting in our house for months in a very unacceptable and insufficient situation. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. also all really connected. You know what I mean? At the yeah. end of the day, like when we talk about why coronavirus would disproportionately affect black and brown communities, we never talk about why. Yeah, we get all these fucking stats thrown at our faces. And it's just like, Oh, look, black people just it seems like they're getting sicker. It's like, uh, yeah, can we talk about why? Because they're more likely to be part of the working class. They're yep. more likely to be one of those people who's out, out there being an essential worker. Yep. They're more likely to be to 
first of all, live in a situation of poverty, you know yeah. what I mean? Like disproportionately because of the history of this country right. and our constant oppression of these communities and yeah. excessive policing of these communities. And every time they have historically thrived, literally people come in and bomb them or kill them or yeah. figure out a way to dismantle their econ socioeconomic standing that yeah. they have built for themselves. So yeah. every time that you see people come up, then you see them down. And I just saw a comment from some ignorant person talking about how if this whole country was racist, that there wouldn't be any famous black people. Like, <laughs> it's a continuous conversation. We really love to talk when we have these conversations about race. We really love to bring up, you know, these kind of token people who have been able to overcome their circumstance, right? Which is granted, like you can you can come across any race and you can do that, right? You can you can always find somebody who has overcome their circumstance. Right. But if we continue to make the story of one, this proposed story of a whole, when right. there are very obvious obstacles that are legal and most times, okay, that get are the impediment of someone becoming successful whatever way they become successful okay if you're not addressing those issues like you're not looking at the larger picture yep and and that's the real problem is that we're really not looking at the larger picture we really want to focus in on yeah but i don't like the looting and the rioting i don't agree uh, with the violence yes. it's like how can you not agree with the violence and stand in support of systemic violence right right, right? So you, it's not just violence, it is systemic violence. It's violence perpetrated by people who are sworn to protect or, or mm -hmm. su whose supposed job is to protect. What are they protecting? Yeah. If we cannot, as a collective, critically assess these kinds of institutions to when, when we have situations where they are very obviously murdering civilians, Yep. Let's take race out of it, right? Because people like to be like, what about black on black crime? And, you know, yeah. more, pe more police kill white people. Why do we, why are we justifying death with more death? Right. And what I think is that like, it's bad. It's, it's bad all the way around. It's fucking bad. It's bad. And then it, and then I go back to like the, 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 the having to be gentle because in that community, and I only bring it up because I think it's important to highlight because we, we are the, the labels we wear and the titles the world give us and then we are who we are. And in the police force and, and several armed for forces, we have to consider our, our men and women of color that are in that space. And we have to really understand and unpack what it is that the experience is in that space that drives them to be in a position where when they are facing someone in their community who is struggling for both of them, that they feel comfortable shoving a baton in their face. What brought them to that point, right? That is a very, very important thing. And so like for me, like, listen, growing up here in the South Bronx, the, the, the trial and tribulation would be one as such that, you know, we grow up in the South Bronx, it's hard out here. It's real hard in these streets. So what happens? I wanna be an upstanding citizen. I wanna get out of these circumstances. I wanna help people also because I see the struggle. I see a pathway to a career like police officers. And maybe I liked playing cops and robbers as a kid. Maybe there's something about just that that line of work that calls to me and it's coming from a very good place great you know i get into the system the system then takes their people and makes them unlearn certain things and then injects new information it tells them these it are the people we target them. yeah it brainwashes them this is the people we need to target this is why this is important this is why you can get away with this low key like you know what i mean like all the things that we know that are the problems but then they're taught that and then they're told and this is what you protect and serve and then they're taught that in a way that we don't actually get taught that. So we don't even understand the depth of the brainwashing, you know what I mean? Um, and so then they're in these systems. And for those who don't go to the sunken place but are in the space, they say, fuck, well, this is terrible. But if I leave, who's, who's going to change the system? So you have some who stay and they're really trying to move up rather than move out because they're trying to do something. But then mm. you have those who see the circumstances are overwhelmed by the work ahead and say, well, I got to take care of my family. And that's why I got into this shit in the first place. So 
peace out movement. I'm not going to move out. I am also going to try to move up, but it is now about me and my personal needs and I and it is not considering the experiences of others. So I'm comfortable being out here and, and beating the shit out of people in the name of cops because they're just out here making our jobs difficult and that's all I care about in the end of the day. And understanding that, because we got to unpack that, we got to come for those people. We got to shake them up a bit and be like, yo, brother, you know what changes? Maybe if we win this movement, you get more mental health support and you don't need to be stigmatized for, for trying to take advantage of it. Or hey, y'all are severely underpaid. Talk about black celebrities. Y'all are on the front lines every day and who's advocating for you to get paid for that level of commitment, right? And like understanding that this is the same fight and that if they do put their batons down, that perhaps we can move something together. Because imagine a world where all the police said not. What are they gonna do? Police, arrest all the police and all the people? What are they gonna do? What are they gonna do? It forces a change. That was so my I, whole entire yeah. thing. Is like when we're talking about this all cops are bad cops situation, right? I think that there's a lot of sensitivity around this because I know that there's a lot of minorities out there who have family members who have um brothers, sisters, aunts, cousins that are in the force, are either in the military or they're in the police force. And we wanna I think that's another thing that needs to be addressed because like, even just talking to my dad, when he reflects on who it was growing up, right, in his high school that ended up becoming a cop, it was usually the people who were not on a path to do anything else with their lives. Yeah. Or they were engaging in a lot of criminal activity when they were younger, right? right? So you have this whole, and that's not to say that that's only minorities. That's a right, lot of, of the course. white men who go into these into these, these things they go practice. into these institutions knowing what they can get away with in those institutions knowing that they're going to be protected by police unions if they commit hate crimes right. knowing that they can exercise their egos to whatever yeah. degree they want because they are above the law they are considered above the law and that's interesting to me too is that dynamic of the people who are supposed to be upholding the law are somehow above the law i feel like that is the biggest contradiction you could possibly be giving your people like that is the biggest oxymoron that could ever be in existence is a supposed institute that is going to be protecting people that is allowed to murder abuse sexually assault maim um <laughs> do whatever whatever they see fit okay for whatever circumstance and they can literally justify it on the back end in their paperwork yep Yep. And and there and and all DAs and all judges and all because right now I mean this is very clearly like a sickness and and the sickness is not new this is not new in any way shape or form like this entire establishment came to be based off of slave patrols yep and yep. maintaining this you know whole law and order you know ideology that is somehow implying and constantly implying that human beings by nature are rowdy chaos driven yeah and it, unable to govern themselves right and unable to hold themselves accountable unable to hold their 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 neighbors accountable you know and we don't even we never ever address the underlying reasons as to why someone would be incapable of that yes you know, when you take resources away from communities, when you do not invest in schools, when Hello. you have juvenile detentions where you're supposed yes. to be teaching children consequence by locking them in cages, when you have legally funded detention centers that are concentration camps, when you have all of these things, when, you, when you're not investing in small businesses and you're not investing in the well-being of on a community at large and yep. you're constantly actually doing the opposite and divesting from them and in and infesting um you know trouble like even just the criminalization of drugs like oh. imagine if we did not criminalize drugs yeah. um, and we treated drug addiction as as a public health issue as yep. it should be because yep. drug addiction is a response very yep. obviously to lack of resource yeah. To, to the feeling of inadequacy, to feeling of unworthiness in a in a society where we literally make people's worth based off of their productivity. Yep. And if you do not give somebody opportunity, they cannot possibly give you back productivity. Absolutely. If you don't have an input, you can't have an output. And we all know that because of all the technology we be using on a regular basis. Yep. So if you don't have an input of resource and investment, you cannot possibly have an output of a law-abiding citizen you know what i mean people are gonna fucking survive whether you like it or not they're gonna figure out a way to survive and that is the core issue and that's yeah. why when we're talking about defunding the police and we talk about care not cops 
We're talking about reinvesting these hundreds of millions and billions yes. of dollars of our taxpayer money, okay? Including these communities, because every single person in these communities of color or black communities, they yep. are taxpaying citizens, just yep. like us. They work their jobs and they pay their motherfucking taxes. So guess what? They deserve their rights to that money. They yes. deserve to have their communities invested in. And we all deserve to, first of all, I think first and foremost, the baseline here is the lack of education, yes. the lack of access to the truth, the real truth, not the white supremacist written history yep. version of the truth. Yep, yep. I, I, everything you said, everything you said and more. And I just like, I think that learning all of that is just the beginning of the work um, and that that is important to note right that if people begin to grow weary because they're like oh man this is so overwhelming we're never going to get anywhere wait a minute because the ride is just it hasn't even started yet this is just you know what we're I just mean? checking like, to make sure our seatbelts are on right like they're still you doing got your seat seat up, that bitch. you got that bar down Right, like you know, they come down. Like you know, you got to make sure because it is what's what is ahead is 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 really something uh, that's going. It's it's we are literally pivoting an entire hegemonic mindset. I mean, we are literally changing the minds of of millions of people, and we're trying to do it all at once. And that is a very heavy task. Um, so, oh, your camera, no Lord. way. Is it paused again? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's you have paused. Some crazy ass face. It's not a crazy face, but you look real serious. Like you really serious. Like I'm really got a point. To me. I got a point to make. <laughs> right. Like you're listening. You're, you're definitely taking in my words in the first. In it's, it's understanding that the work comes ahead. Mm -hmm. um, and How are we one, doing? Am I back? No. I'm still not back. Mm -mm. Oh my god, I'm literally in the same exact space that I've do been you wanna, in all day. Do you want to hop on and off? No, because then we're going to lose the whole live. I can't do Oh, that. you're right. We also, we have like 10 minutes left. So I'd rather, I, hold on. let me just try to see if I could find a more reasonable space. How, how are we doing now? How about now? It's like still... That T-Mobile commercial where it's like, can you hear me now? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. The, the can you hear me now commercials. Can you hear me now? Um, uh, yeah, no, it's still, you still have it. It's still like, paused for real? Yeah, 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 it's still paused. Oh my God, still I'm paused. so upset. No. no. Hold on, let me. The people want to see your Let's face, girl. try it again. <laughs> Hello. This is, you know, when yes, you spit no, too much no. truth, Instagram acts up. When you're spitting way too much truth, Instagram always finds a way. That is the facts way. of life. Okay. That is so real. I've also noticed, like, engagement goes down, like, for some reason. Yep. Even if people are definitely wanting the vibes. Um, okay. Can you see me now? I don't know. <laughs> Coño. All right. Well, hold up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save this. Okay. Live and I'm gonna post it, but then I'm also gonna I'm gonna restart again. So okay. I'm gonna post this and then we'll keep going and then I'll post that again. All right, I'm back. I posted the first one. Um, I apologize for the the internet's acting up. Um, hopefully, what I was seeing was what was posted. But if not, um, it's okay. This is. We're going into part two of this conversation. I think this is a conversation that we're probably going to have to keep having too. To be honest, because there's so many layers to it. There's so much. There's so much to talk about. There's so much to talk about. So much to unpack. So we're going to keep getting into it. All right. Let's go, Julissa. Julissa! <laughs> Waiting on you. Yes. Here I am. Yes. So much to talk about and sing about and like, you know, express ourselves in several ways. No, for real. I really think that this is such an awesome moment. In yeah, time. I've been writing like crazy. Yeah, I just started like I, I I'm like halfway through a spoken word that, that I started writing and I'm like, damn, like, you know, like the words are coming because the, the spirit, is, spirit is working. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a moment in time and we're gonna see a lot of art. I mean, I think one thing like in a weird way, like when we're trying to stand in gratitude in the middle of all this chaos, um, I think something to be grateful for is the way in which people have 
found their voices and are, and, are, and are just expressing them in so many multitudes of ways and touching so many different audiences that it just it warms my heart. Like, you know what I mean? To know that everybody has a voice of someone who's willing to speak and like conversations like these, right? Like I'm a, I'm a voice and I'm like, you know, a Bronx Latina, but like, you know, Miami, right? Like Miami can hear me and the Bronx needs to hear you, right? And like, just like the ways in which we're finding these intersections and what I was, um, gonna say before we went off the live is that another huge intersection that I want to shout out that I think our communities need to sort of do the work for to show up for is the LGBTQ AI plus community. Oh my god. Um, we again. need to yeah we need to start showing up for them in a way that we haven't been um, and I know that that's a tough one right because that really taps on people's beliefs in a very specific way and I get it. I get it. I really, I understand. I grew up in a Christian household and I've heard all the reasons and all the stories as to why I know, but guys, it's an old mentality and we need to understand where our scriptures have been co-opted from because it is not Whoa. that scripture and hey, yes. things are not scripture. worthy. Like Jesus is not our savior. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I'm not anti, I'm not anti-religion or belief in any sort of way, but it's about understanding how the stories were passed down. We've all played the phone, the telephone game. We know how that happens. And, it, and, and what we need to understand that in some cases it was intentional, the ways that the words were distorted. Uh, our connection to spirit is ours and it lives within us and it has nothing to do with the construct but there's nothing wrong with follow following a system that feels right for you and how how you want to you know mm -hmm. have that relationship essentially yeah. um you know what i mean and we need to dismantle that because if that's at the core of why we think it's okay that people like ayana dior who got beat up by 30 men in a store um <laughs> or tony mcdade who's who got killed right around the same time as george floyd and no one is saying his name you know what I mean he's our trans brother we need to be there to to support each other and, and and that work is important and like you know listen as a cis woman it is important for me to show up because I have brothers and sisters in my community who need me to show up who show up for me Amen. who show up for me and so like Constantly. that is so important and it's pride month guys like yes. don't get it twisted don't get it twisted to say we can't celebrate pride we celebrate pride because stonewall was a riot led by Marcia a black Johnson, trans was woman a black, a black woman. trans woman Marcia you know Johnson, what i mean like we started that that is our history we are that yo we are that fly bro we're at the forefront of so many movements we as black people are that fly. That image that we see of like the black power fist at the Olympics, that's a Cubano man. That's an Afro-Cubano man. And it's an image that we only circulate in the black community. That is a Cubano man. You understand, like, it is important that we understand the associations and the intersections, but it has to also include the LGBTQAI plus community. It cannot just be, oh, you know, Afro-Latinos are also Latinos. It goes past that. It is time. We are in a revolution. No more of the bullshit. It is time to cut the shit. It is time to call people out. And let me tell you something. I always say pay attention to the corporations because this is a capitalist society. When you see corporations scattering like fucking roaches because they are scared to lose your dollar, understand your power. Understand, understand your power in that movement. You have to understand your power and we have to we have to shift the ways in which we we circulate our energy. Going back to what you were saying, there's not giving us a lot of input, but we sure as hell give them a lot of output. Output is <laughs> for a dollar. Oh it's my your God. dollar, sweetie. Like, where do you invest it? You're mad they burned down a Target. Oh, you're bad. You're mad about that, but you're not supporting the small business in your in your community. But then you're also mad they looted it. But you're not about to go shop there once Target's open again, are you? You have to understand. You know yes. what I mean? Like the ways in which you have to show up. The like, power. The power that we have as a community. I. I mean, I wholeheartedly agree with you on the message of right in all of these conversations. The intersection of, you know. LGBTQIA plus communities visibility is is pertinent because there is no liberation without everyone's liberation. That is just yes. a fact of life. You can't like, and this is again, like one of the many ways that I was schooled about like the reform, like trying to go with the reform angle of things is like, you can't take baby steps towards people's freedom. You can't take baby steps towards understanding that we are all worth at the very least, okay, we are worth understanding that each one right. of us life is worthy. You right. know, we all are meant to be alive simply because we are alive. 
we are yeah. taking up the space we are and breathing there's no extra explanation for it like that's right why we deserve it is because we're here and we're alive. Like, and they're so lucky that we are just looking for equal rights and that we're not looking for revenge. I'm Let me so, make that very we, clear. We, oh, what is her last name? I think Johnson. I don't want to, I don't want to misspeak, but I saw, I saw this beautiful black woman who, who was really proclaiming like she, she spoke for like six minutes about this exact thing. She's like, you're lucky that like we're looking for equality and that we're not looking for revenge. And that yeah. is the truth beyond truth. And I think that that at the end of the day is the at the real core as to why white people are refusing to look at this moment mm -hmm. are the ones that are refusing to look at this moment and not grow. It's not because you don't see it. Mm -hmm. It's not because you think it doesn't exist. It's because you're scared as fucking hell that you're going to be put in the position that black people have been in for the past 400 years. Yep. That's the, at the root of all of these issues is the envy. At the root of all of these issues is the, the fear of shit. Am I going to get treated the way that I've, am I going to get what I've been dishing out? Right. Am I going to have to reap what I sow? That's the real issue. And that is what people need to be sitting with right now in that uncomfortability, comfortability that we are, we're all experiencing. When yeah. we get confronted with these things, we really need to be looking deep, 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 deep down inside. It's like, why am I feeling uncomfortable? Is it because yep. what they're telling me isn't true? Is it yep. because what they're telling me is too much or in a weird tone or too aggressive or whatever? Like, no, bitch. Like, that's not right. the problem. <laughs> like, it's not the tone. It's not the way it's being told to you. It's not the fact that you have to look it up on your own and that Black people cannot be doing this extra fucking emotional labor work for you. Hello. And having to explain things to you. There are resources upon resources upon resources out there for us to, to, to look at and to read. Yeah. We have to take the initiative if we truly mean to be taking initiative. We have to make the move to be better for ourselves and have these uncomfortable conversations with our family members and right. have these uncomfortable conversations with our neighbors and our sisters and our cousins and whoever the hell else has the audacity to still not believe in, the, in, the, in human life. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, we're, we're, we're above that. Yep. And it sucks because I feel like a lot, of, a lot of Black people are being put in a position where they have to be nice about whether or not they, or whether or not they're going to educate somebody about right. what they've been fucking screaming at the top of their lungs for I don't even know how long it's forever. Like. forever. You know what I mean? It's not their responsibility, and we have to just come to terms with that. And we cannot police the way that they tell us that. Like, like we need to take the policia out of our own minds and heads yep. and hearts. Like that little white supremacist that lives in each of our our hearts that shames us when we when we haven't done enough or shames right. us when we're not productive enough or shames us because we were wrong. Like we really need to get over that little bitch and we really need to get acquainted with our higher selves and yep. the, the people that we're meant to become because they don't have time for the petty, like so self sorry bullshit right now. Right. You have to take yourself out of the equation and you really have to look at how have I been complicit in these systems? How, right. am, what am I doing from my corner of the earth, from my body? to make this world a more progressive place and to make this place safer for my black brothers and sisters right. across the board and folks, non-binary right. folks as well. Right. In, and our trans brothers and sisters, like everyone is included in the conversation because we're all human beings. Right. We're all little it's, humans. It's really that. And, and it's, we, we gotta keep, we gotta keep finding that language. I'm going to say it again. We have to keep finding the language to have these conversations. And you're absolutely right about how people are, there's there's a lot of performative um, activism right now. Oh my God. There's a lot of people, like, I, I love my friends, but I have a lot of my white friends who feel the need to reach out to me to, one, make sure I'm good, which I'm okay with that. Thank you for checking in on me. But number two, then list all the things that they've done. Almost like, and then here's here's what, here's here's my list. So so I'm, I'm not on the naughty list, right? Because I signed this petition and I told it's that here. It's that, that in intrinsic guilt that it's like, am I doing <laughs> enough? Like, am I approved of, of is this enough? for me to prove that I love you right you know and it, the, the the proof comes in the consistent showing up exactly and this is a consistent battle this is not one that stops because I you know I have been having these conversations and, and in conversation with a lot of grassroots organizers for years you know what I mean like they've been doing this work people have been doing this work this yes. work has been written they've been doing the 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 seminars and the lectures and all of that that is in existence and it's yeah. tangible things that you could like rachel cargill's amazing she does mm -hmm. a lot of work with healing 
you know, yeah. our bullshit <laughs> instead of, you know, and of course her focus is her own community, but she does a lot of work with, with, you know, white people who really want to be allies in this situation. Yep. And I think the main thing about allyship is understanding that it's not performative. It's not just you posting one black exactly. square. Exactly. Because I have a lot of people in my life who I called out for posting a, a black square only, you know? Right. And a lot of people got really upset about that because they're like, I'm trying, I'm doing what I can. And it's like, no, you're not. Right. Right. Just you're not. And I don't and I don't mean to be rude about it. I don't mean to make you feel sad and, and then you feel discouraged and not even want to try. Yeah. This is a point where we need to stop being toddlers. Mm -hmm. A lot of us are, are toddlers right now. We are walking through this new world of of wool wool past our eyes, like, whoa, like wow, right. this is really fucked up for people of color, man. Like, wow, this is really fucked up. Yeah. And of course, there's an interesting guilt that comes with that. You know what I mean? Of course, right. you're going to feel bad about that. Of course, you're going to feel right. probably really heightenedly bad about your own role in that. And how right. many times you've, you're coming to the realization you've been a part of the problem. Right. But all of that guilt is needs to be transmuted into action. That's the main thing right now that I think everyone's asking for across the board is like, if you really want to be better and you want to show up better, it's like, I'm not going to like pardon your past and like, it's okay that you're right. racist because it's never going to be okay. But it is something that we were indoctrinated with. And so you can do the work to be better. And you can't get lost in the self pity. You really need to get a grip on how, on your strength, on your courage, on your bravery to, to right. be on the right side of history for once, you know? Right. And to heal the intergenerational trauma of your ancestors and whatever your ancestors might have possibly done to black people over right. the course of our history or, or, or to their black relatives or to their black, you know, community members. There, right. like, there's a lot of pain that has been done. And, and of course it's not stuff that can be undone, but it's stuff that can be worked on to heal, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think one like one other point that I want to drive home is um, we have to change the narrative about thinking that, oh, well, there's all the black people who don't care themselves and they decide to, you know, like sit Be down and for government checks to come in and blah, 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 even though the people, the highest number of people on welfare are white, by the way, if, if y'all didn't know that fact. But say, but like, can you repeat that stat for the people, please? Yeah, the majority of the people in the United States who receive welfare and benefits from the government are white people because we forget that we have a whole rural white America. We have the, you know a lot of these folks and a lot of them are yes the within the trump supporting community um, and they're having a completely different experience that we are like in our own poverty and like experiencing that are so disconnected from that that's another unlearning i mean i'm not even gonna go there that's but a whole other level <laughs> that that is its own fucking clusterfuck and guess what white people instead of trying to rush here and trying to look good for me go work on those people because the same way you want to point out uh our crack epidemics or our gang problems and our, the myth. same way you want to point that out let me we gotta talk about men go look at your own motherfucking people you have issues that you need to focus on too and by the way a lot of the shit i have to deal with is because young motherfuckers you know wouldn't leave us alone or like reverend sharpton says because you had your knee on our neck right and so like that is why we have extra shit to work on so please go work in your corner let me work in my corner stop trying to get a little stamp of approval so that you can say well that one black girl in my life said what i'm doing is enough Fuck the one black person or two black people in your life. We're talking about an entire community, an entire movement. And if that one black person also doesn't understand the, the depth of their movement, then it's not their job to cover all those bases for you. You need to meet all the black people at all of the intersections to do the work. It is your job. And it has been in your face. And I feel like a lot of people, the hard part is going to be looking back at their lives and thinking about all the moments where they saw that shit and they turned away. And listen, not every black person is going to be there to call you out, but it's your job to sit with the truth of what you know about how you've behaved or have not behaved. Because guess what? George Floyd's death is not any more or less horrendous than all of the deaths that have happened in, in 2020 alone, in 2019 alone. I mean, you want to go back? You want to go back to 1619? It is not the worst the only reason that it is that we are this passionate is because we are in a moment in time where we have the power to make enough enough. And if we slow the fuck down and if we stay tied to our fears, because at the end of the day, I have a spiritual advisor. She always says fear is false evidence appearing as real. 
right? False evidence has appeared in rear. Her name is Readings by Viva. <laughs> incredible woman right but that is so true it is false evidence appearing real and so we have to we have to understand what is the truth what is the truth and if you're afraid of the truth then understand that and own where you're staying stagnant because i'm fine with people who are like you can talk me to death julissa i don't give a fuck my life is my life and i believe what i believe that's fine understand you are making a choice to be stagnant and i won't even call it right or wrong but the consequences will be what they are period and you have to deal with that so ownership you better oh, speak to them ownership. you know yes. i'm tired girl i'm tired of this i've been to literally my first job i, I started work, i've not been unemployed since the age of 14. my first job was at my local council person's office because i was like oh that's an opportunity we need to fix where we're at we've always needed to fix where we're at we didn't need police to be killing us to know that we needed to fix where we've been at amen this is bigger than george floyd stop hopping off the activism train because you think it's not your community it is this country's revolution right now because the united states is a black country because black people built it okay so this is our history. It's not just black history. We're living in American history. Right yeah, now. honestly, when, when people complain about like the property being destroyed, I laugh. I really it's do. I laugh. Because I'm like, how, that's not even like, first of all, we're on native territory. Right. You have literally put natives onto reservations yep. and told them that that's the only space that they're allowed to have, even though this whole entire space was theirs. And we yep. violate their treaties to this day. And yep. you want to talk about property? Yeah. You want to talk about what's owned and what is not owned? Or yep. what is earned and what is not earned? Or yep. what is deserved and what is not deserved? Okay. We can get into those conversations, but they're, they're, they're pretty deep. I don't think yeah. a lot of people want to hear the truth. <laughs> yeah, girl. Girl, let me tell you, they'll knock us off of Instagram so fast. <laughs> so, fast. so fast, these settler colonizers. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and it's not to, I'm sorry, I got passionate. I'm not yelling like child. That's love. Do that's not love. apologize. That's Give harsh love. Thing. Don't apologize <laughs> for your me. passion, mama. Like, that's another thing. Like, be as passionate as you are. Use your full capacity of your voice. That's what I was given to you, for sure. Yeah. Girl, you deserve to be, first of all, enraged, if that's how you feel. Be fucking oh. enraged. You feel passionate, you feel free, okay. you feel whatever you feel, feel all of the feels, you know? Yeah. yeah. That's and another I'm thing like... you need to stop policing black women, especially about how the fuck they express themselves or their, yeah. or what they've been through. Like, yeah. that is not our place to, yeah. to, to say anything about whether or not we like the, like the pal palpability of their words. Like, yeah. that is not our place. We, yeah. we need to just listen, actually. And granted, if you feel like you're being talked at, you, if you feel like you're being talked to, you need to sit with why you feel that way. Right. That's probably, that, that anger that you're feeling towards you is not anger towards you. It's anger towards a, a very, uh, it's a blanket statement at this point. Yeah. So if it, if it pertains to you and it affects you to where you feel called out by the energy at which this person is speaking, then you gotta, you've got work to do. It always goes back to us It everything goes back. We are just spirits having a human experience at the end of the day. We are just spirits having a human experience and our Amen. spirits have lived and lived several yes. lives and all that wisdom. And every time your intuition speaks at you, it's not just the moment of now. It's the history of back then, when, and that spirit saying, we did this already. We did this yeah, already. This. Speak we up. Stop repeating Speak this up. shit. And, and when you ignore it, it never feels good. Let me tell you something. All the people in our community who are like feeling too afraid to move, that shit doesn't feel good. But you know what? The system knows that. And the system is so glad to have the people who step out of line and have all that stuff because it, it, create, it makes it difficult for us to build up from where we're at. But like, it's really, it's all, you're all you got, guys. You got to really step into yourself and demand the truth of, of the spaces you occupy. Demand them to respect the way in which you guys enter these spaces. We can no longer conform to something that was never meant to serve us. There is 1% of our population that has all the wealth. 1% of our population has all of the wealth. And we are the ones who cry, fight, and kill each other, trying to get money that is never coming down. And trying to get resources. we're not holding it. It's not between us. I, I'm fighting you. You're, I'm, you're not the one holding my bag. They're holding my bag. And if I'm upset and I feel defensive because the world I'm trying to protect is one that I've built with my blood, sweat, and tears, right? And I don't want you to destroy that. I have to understand that when you destroy that, there's a reason and a circumstance that put you in the position to have to do that because why would you otherwise? 
Nobody just does it for fun. That's a false narrative. No one misbehaves and, and commits looting and crimes just for fun. It is out of necessity. Ooh, and they feel like people. it's necessary. Except white people. I'm sorry, because I have seen a lot of white people cause a lot of destruction for because right. they fucking feel because, like And you know what? And even because that has their a reason. Feelings because they, don't, they don't know how to articulate themselves. Because even that has a reason. Because the only reason they know how to loot and break windows and do that shit is because they don't know how to have a strong voice. And so what they do is break shit. It is still an expression that is wrong and I don't agree with it but even that is an expression right and why is that the expression of those people because even though they're fucking white they have been put down the thumb of people who have not given them the articulation and the resources to really express themselves we're That's all a huge thing here yeah I think even just like when we talk about like the patriarchy because that's the, the core root of all of this too because you know women are Girl. second class citizens to men before all of the race issues come into play right if we're just doing and that's it that's if they re like if you're femme passing as well because I, like i want to even talk about like the census for example Oof. i was filling out the census and i just want to talk about how terrible it is like just it's the shitty way, right it's it's disgusting it's first of all super heteronormative you can only pick between two sexes oh. they only have male or female you can't even click other to fill in whatever they just don't have it so that's the first issue i had with it Second issue I had was the next question was about my Hispanic origin. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Whether I was Hispanic, Latino, or Spaniard were the, was the question. Yeah. The options were, no, I am not Hispanic, Latino, or Spaniard, right? That was the first question. The second question was, yes, I am Mexican, Mexican-American, or Chicano. Those were the three options of that right. option. The third option was, yes, I'm Puerto Rican. The fourth was, yes, I'm Cuban. And then the last option, okay, I'm gonna say this. The last option was, yes, I am of Hispanic, Latino, Spanish descent. Um, and then you had to fill in other. And the examples were like Dominican, Panamanian, mm -hmm. um, for uh, just the, all of the other, all of the others, quote unquote, right? So I was like, my Hispanic origin. I was like, <laughs> I mean, I'm Cuban, like, yeah. I'm for sure I'm Cuban, but I was born in Miami. I don't even have that option. I don't have Cuban American. Right. It's not an option. There's Mexican American as an option, but Cuban American is not, or Puerto Rican right. American is not. Dominican isn't even on there. <laughs> that shit is fucking wild to me. Like, I had to click both. I had to click, yes, I'm Cuban, and yes, I am Cuban, and I had to write in Cuban American. Because I didn't even know what the fuck to pick. I didn't know what right. was real. And then, here's the kicker. The next part that comes up is, what is my race? After yes. asking me my Hispanic <laughs> origin, they asked me, what is my race? Yeah. And there's no Hispanic option. There's no Latino option. Yeah. There is white, which is, in, when it's described, it says Irish, English, um, Swiss, whatever, like European white. And then they have Egyptian in there, which I was like, uh, Egyptian North Africa, you fucking weirdos. Like, what do you, how is Egyptian white? And yes, yeah. of course, there's some white Arabs, but like, or Egyptians, excuse me, that's not the same thing. But I was literally like, what, what is the, what, what? It makes no, make it make sense. Make it make sense. Make it make sense. Make and it so it was, sense. that was the white option was one. And then black is another option. And then they have Pacific Islander. They have, you know, Chinese. They have J Japanese. They have quite a few breakdowns of, of diff different Asians, like in major categories. And, but like, I was, I was just flabbergasted. I was like, first of all, I can't even pick any of these things because I don't identify with any of these things at all, right? right? So I click white, but then I wrote in, my skin is white, if that's what you mean, dot, 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 yeah. in, my, in, the, in the comment section. <laughs> and then at the end, I click other, and I put Cuban American again, because that's what the fuck right. I am. I'm Cuban American. I don't know, why do we even have that category? And what are what are what government issued things are you using that quote unquote data for that isn't doesn't have because another thing is like this this information can't be used against you right but what right. if I'm undocumented yes it can be used against right. me and yes it will be used against me it's a fucking lie yeah and it's so interesting because they say they say that um, a lot of those demographic uh, points are are taken because that's how they put money in your communities and then they can like really identify what the populations are that are in certain groups. Exactly. <laughs> Which I'm like. Besides how much money is going into your communities or whether you're going to get right. supported or not. And actually on the back end, that allows for your mayor to know exactly what color or what quote unquote race everyone or Hispanic origin everyone in all of these different communities come from. Because for the Miami census, it was 
Hispanic origin was was a category of itself. So that mm -hmm. means they understand how dense of a of a demographic they have right. that is Hispanic or quote unquote Latino or whatever the hell, right? Yeah. So the fact that that's its own singular thing to pick, but then when you go to the race category, we have no options. I think is just wild. Yeah, it's weird and then, fucking like, wild. And and there's like and I encourage folks to definitely like look up the history of the census and like how certain term and like how that was why the term Hispanic came about. Like there's a lot there's a lot to unpack there that I think is is worth um, uh, looking at. But yeah, I think like even even understanding the breakdown of the census and like we are encouraging everyone to to um, fill it out. But I think it even like we have to teach people the why behind the action. Um, mm -hmm. And even like when we tell people vote, like yes, vote, but like. For a lot of folks, there's a distrust of that system. So if what we're if we're all collectively agreeing that yes, it is a broken system, but there is a action or there's a reason why we still have to work within the system or play within that system, then we have to be really clear about what that is. And I feel like when we're for some folks when they're trying to have that conversation, it's just like, oh, are you going to vote? And once they hear the no, they're ready to attack someone. And like, no one, you're not going to get me to do shit if you're going to attack me. Number one. Okay, so you gotta learn how to come to me correct. Number two, it's like you have to really be able to understand like the, the the mission here, right? Because then when folks are voting, like if they're putting all their hope on that one vote and then they don't get what they think they're supposed to get in return for that vote, then that's where the distrust continues to build. So we have to actually be very, very uh, intentional about how we're talking about ver voting within our communities so that it makes sense, make it make sense. Like we were saying, make it make, it make sense. sense so that people feel motivated to take the action um and then there's one thing i wanted to to somebody had in in the, in the comments said that we were sort of condoning looters i just want to go back and say that that's again an opportunity to change language i don't think anyone here and i can i'll speak for myself at least i'm not condoning we condoning is a, right i mean stealing is one of the i mean stealing in itself is like that's what we don't like stealing but the government steals from its people Right. It is, it is about, so instead of saying you guys are condoning the looters, you can say, you know, hey, you guys maybe aren't considering how the looting really affected certain people in a way that's really deep. So that I can then politely come back to you and say, no, actually, I do understand those things. However, what I am seeing is that systemically, if there weren't all these issues that, that we're fighting against in the first place, we wouldn't need to worry about these folks getting the right insurance and, and, and being afraid of the security with which they'll be able to rebuild right like they looted here in the Bronx pretty bad and like because a lot of folks like that language used felt like I was condoning you know what I did I got up my next the next day and I went to go help clean because great you know what if I'm gonna stand behind the message of what I'm saying I'm also willing to understand the layers of it and the layer is that even though I felt that way the person who shot I went to go help clean certainly doesn't agree with me but I still am here for that person so I'm showing up so here here I am with the broom because I understand that of how this affected you and that's how you show up it is a 360 it is a holistic thing it's not just one direction that we're looking at and how we help and it, we have to really think about that so I just wanted to sort of address that because I know that that's something a lot of people feel like oh people are condoning it's not about condoning it's about understanding and reframing um, and then tackling from there yeah, it's also even having that conversation about like why it's okay, like why it's cool if Target gets looted because Target has that major insurance. You know, Target is a major corporation that can replace right. all of that stuff versus a right. small business who doesn't have that insurance and who more than likely didn't get a business loan from the bank to yeah. have built up and actually saved all of their shit to create their, their small business. One thing I am also seeing is mutual aid efforts to help rebuild black businesses and Absolutely. help rebuild small businesses. That's the things that we're not talking about when we're having these conversations is the way that the community is still showing up for these small businesses to make sure that they don't just get lost in the dust, you know? Because mm -hmm. another thing about these looting and rioting that's going on or whatever, the looting, when we're talking about why people do that, you know, that is a lot of people's only opportunity in their minds to be able to get the things that they need, that they need. their necessities. You right. know, so yeah, they do wait for that opportunity to be able to do that. And that's not, um, again, I'm not referring to every single person at all in any way, shape or form. And I'm definitely not, I want it to be very clear that protesters are a separate group of people. Exactly. There are more the than, and the, the majority of people there are right. not there to steal things. You know what I mean? Like at all. But again, when we're, when we're talking about why these circumstances create a scenario where someone feels like they can go looting, right? Right. We have to talk about, People's disparity, man. 
the the fact that people are in situations where they feel like that might be their only opportunity to get things that they are told they need by society. Right. Because also we have a society who has a lot of, you know, mainstream artists, a lot of politicians, a lot of, you know, socialites that tell everybody they're worthless if they don't have money and they're worthless if they don't have money. Exactly. That's so what, I was gonna what say. do you think that's going to be doing to an educated populace? You taught us to lose. You taught us. You taught us that before the importance of a life comes the importance of our materialism of and how we can flex. You taught us that. Like, you know what I mean? And whether or not we perpetuated that is a whole other conversation, but we perpetuated it because we were trying to make sure that we had the status as well. Everybody wants to be down. Everybody wants the status. We were following orders, okay? So this idea that it's innate and it's because I thought, because I've seen a lot of it. No, it's so mono. It's so mono que se ponen whatever, calling black people monkeys and trying to compare us to animals in the way that you were conditioned. To, to believe, because that's another thing, a huge point, I can't believe I haven't even said this already. The whole problem uh, in this situation is that people have been trained to be desensitized to the oppression of black lives. Amen. People have been desensitized black to lives. the, the oppression of, of black lives, of black business, of black people. We can see it over and over again. Why? Because our media teaches it. Because when we watch award Oscar winning movies, they're all about fucking slavery and watching us get whipped. Um, you know what I mean? Like, because when we, you know, we're very selective about the lenses. When we wanted to lenses gangster rap, we wanted to make sure everybody knew they were criminals and didn't listen to the nuances of the, the lyrics, right? Like, there's just so many ways that they control the narrative and we get spoon fed it and we don't know how to spit it back in their face but they sure as hell know how to take what we try to give them and inform them with and spit it back in our faces. Oh, really quick. I think that that's something even like in dynamics of argument. Like, I think we've all learned the way that people are supposed to argue, mm -hmm. the way we argue with one another is to throw other things in each other's face. Like I find that a lot of the time when I'm trying to argue with someone or uh, about why this is a, a relevant movement that everyone should be, you know, in tandem with, Right. They, people just love to bring up past and just right. be like, oh, well, they didn't stand up for me when this happened. And they were never with me when I was bullied when I was younger by Black people. And, you know, because like a lot of Cubans who grew up here, of course, grew up in the poorer parts of Miami, which, of course, are mostly comprised of people of color, you know. So mm -hmm. when you have a white Cuban who is poor and in these neighborhoods, of course, they're probably getting bullied right. <laughs> because they're not of the same color you know what i mean and right. because these little kids experience outside of what they're experiencing right now has been racism right you know so if they see someone who's not like them in their space they're going to be racist that is just like it's the way that it works of course it's not the same caliber right. of racism in any way because right. there's totally different ways that systems actually oppress people versus not right but it exists and a huge line that we're not ever addressing is that yes racial disparities but the, the real big thing here is rich versus poor, is yes. money versus not having yes. money, you know? Yeah. Because there's so many different subcategories in the poverty level yeah. that keep all of us from fighting each other's fight right. with each other, you know? Right. That keep us feeling like each of our individual fights are different from the, the entire fight, which is freedom and liberation yeah. from these, these oppressive systems. And that, that have been letting in one win brings yours back is another thing we're taught. Like, uh, oh, well, exactly. I'm, I'm not competition. Competition, so I can't put too much attention Carson. to that because, you know, we need to focus on this. And it's just kind of like, well, no, 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 no. There's the, inter again, intersections. That's a big word. Listen, use the, for all of you guys, download that vocabulary, intersection, intersection. There's so mm -hmm. many, because more than two things can be true. So another great word is duality. It can both be true. You know what I mean? That like- And untrue. Yeah, and, and, and you know, it could both be true. Like, for example, this call out culture we have, which is important. I think it's super important, but I think that once the people are called out, we haven't done a good job of making sure what the next steps are outside Amen. of canceling. How do we go beyond canceling to actually make those martyrs, right? When they're being martyrs, the people who get like torn down, which for uh, most time for good reason, but like, let's put the education behind that outside of just teaching cancel. It's, it's call it's, in versus call. You have to call, yeah, yeah call in versus 
calling out because there's going to be listen and we've like you know i know i've existed in spaces where hell like i've been put in corners and i'm seeing some sort of injustice and i'm maybe like maybe it's related to work and i'm like fuck if i speak out i'm gonna fuck up this whole project or i'm gonna bring some bad blood and then like that might be real and the person who's in the room who i'm not supporting in the moment is going to remember that five years might fast forward five years they might be in this moment and be like, yeah, Julissa, you're supporting black lives and you're blah, 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 blah. But I remember the time when you did X, Y, Z, and then boom, that shit's gonna come out. And then what do I have to do, right? I have to be able to go back. And if I don't already know how I was wrong, I gotta go back and be able to say, all right, shit, well, they called me out. How can I get called out? I'm a black woman, this is my fight too. What did I do wrong, right? And I need to be able to really sit with that information and, and then move forward and be able, like a real apology, and the reason we don't always accept celebrity apologies is because they, you can tell they haven't done that step before coming back out and saying something. But we've all been part of groups where like one person has spoken up and been like, hey, I had a bad experience in this space and no one here advocated for me. You know what I mean? And then like, and it's like, so it feels fake to see them as advocates now well make sure you've done the work so that when those people speak up because it's valid it's valid to be called out even when if you did something years ago that you can actually come back and speak for the work that you've done yeah i am imperfect i am yeah. imperfect i'm not even gonna front and say that i am i got called out plenty of times growing up you, you know what i mean especially once i left miami miami mm -hmm. is a disgustingly anti-black like society like especially in the like upper echelon that I grew up in. I grew up in private school. I went to Carrollton, you know what I mean? Like it's mostly white Cubans, mostly white or, or, or um, upper class Hispanics. You know what I mean? It is what it, or Latinos is what it was, you know? And I was not, I was very much lower middle class and I right. was on scholarship and I had, you know, a lot of financial aid. And that was the reason I was able to be there because I was very intelligent. Right. But that was why I was there, was because of my intelligence. I could not have been there socioeconomically, you know what I mean? And right. I felt that difference. I felt that stark contrast of, of my existence versus the, the complete disconnection from the rest of the world that these people had, you know what I mean? And, and the anti-blackness that was just so, it was like water. It was like, like having three black girls in the grade was like, what? Like, they're right. clearly not here because they can afford it. You know what I mean? Like, that was just understood. You know what I mean? In, yeah. in conversation. Like, yeah. that was that was how disgusting things were, things are and were, you know what I mean? And that's why I think right now it's just such a beautiful moment is because we're reckoning with a lot of that stuff right yes. now. I'm having those conversations even further with people who, like, will come out of their way to try to, you know, tell me something about what, what I'm supporting, what I'm not supporting right now, you know right. what I mean? is it's causing those conversations. And granted, I learned a lot when I was younger, you know what right. I mean? When I was 16, I stepped out of Miami and I was put in a girl group even, like Norm Normani, who was black, you know? Her yes. being around her and feeling her experience through, the, through what we went through, like yes. it was a her experience was very different from the rest of our experience. And 100% due to the fact that she was black, you know? Right. And, and that was constantly confronted and constantly part of, part of the conversation, you know what I mean? Yes. And it, it's unfortunate because in a lot of ways we didn't understand that struggle. In a lot of ways we couldn't, we couldn't um, even like make space for that at the time, you know what I mean? Because yeah. cause of what we were going through, you know? And, and what we were going through on a grander level, industry-wise, by the people who were in control of what we were doing, you know what I'm yes. saying? And we I think that that's important layers to call that out so, like, I that can't layer even of control. Or to her experience because it was its own unique experience within our experience. So, yeah. like, that's a whole nother thing. It's like, there's so many layers to the shit, bro. Yeah. And it's so important, like, and I'm so glad that you brought that up, um, you know, because I've heard, I've, you know, I've heard those stories. And I think, like, even a moment like this, like, you acknowledging it in a moment like this is so big. And that's just where we have to be. Like, we just know the truth. Let's just speak to it. Speak a truth to power. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I just, we, we kind of just have to have these uncomfortable moments and these conversations. Look, I had a moment with a friend of mine where he was like, wow, look at this old video I dug up from when I was in high school. And I was, like, reenacting a scene that he had wrote. And, like, it was my favorite scene but I was like trying to be Asian and I had my fingers like this in the video and so like I you know and it was me literally being like oh my god I miss your scene so much and I'm reenacting it right so it wasn't a demeaning act but I still like he said this to me and he was like oh haha it looks so funny and I was like that's not funny and I owe you an apology like it's not funny and I owe you an apology and like and and it's listen and that's my brother and it's fine and like it wasn't an experience that hurt him in any way but I have to be able to call out those things because I need him to understand that that's unacceptable behavior from anyone else as well 
you know so like sometimes owning our own shit is so that we are leading by example that's the most important part examples we have accountability is is it yeah. right? like we really got to have that conversation i think it's like we must take accountability even when it's uncomfortable even when we don't want to admit to ourselves that we're not the best people right you know when we don't want like that's the main thing is not wanting to have to feel like a part of our character is someone who's careless or someone who's thought right. who's not thoughtful or someone who who intentionally tries to harm people i know that for the majority of us of course the intention is not harm but the intention versus the impact is a huge part of this conversation just because your intention was good does not mean that you had a positive impact on the person you were engaging with and just because you didn't do that does not make you a bad person but right. you you choosing to run away from accountability is what makes you a bad person does that make right. sense it's like right. you choosing to run away from that and and not allowing yourself to be held accountable and right. and reinforcing this this idea that like i'm just i'm not i'm not racist I just, I'm not racist. It's like, you might not want to be racist. You might not agree with those ideals, but what you said was, and what you were doing was. Right. So acknowledging that and being like, you know what? I, I didn't realize before, but this behavior is racist and I apologize for that. And right. I'm going to do better moving forward. That's all we can do. You know right. what I mean? Like, unfortunately, that's all we can do. But the more we run away from it and the more we refuse to identify with it, that's where we get lost in the sauce and all the chaos starts to come across is because oh i run without even trying but but that's when it happens is because we we're so we're so much more concerned with how we look right and and how people perceive us right then then what then the pain that we're causing by right. by not taking that accountability yeah. you know and that at the end of the day is what all black people are asking for right now is a fucking accountability yep is for us to see where we need to grow to take responsibility for the parts of that are not their responsibility anymore right. and so let them fucking live their fucking lives that's yep. it that's all that's being asked right now is that we stop policing communities that we don't understand right exactly exactly and 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 then educate yourself and then understand and the understand issues that you're having with that community and being able to call yourself out and to take ownership where ownership is due um and also i think and in, and in that understanding that you don't get to um control how people respond you're Ooh. only you're only in control of what you can say to forgive you so if i you know what i mean if i say something and i you know apologize however i apologize and i take ownership for some people the hurt might be deeper than what you can offer in the moment and that's that but you have to take the ownership and then it's your job to lead by example and live your life by those words as opposed to only being performative for the one moment and that's where it comes through and that's where it follows through so there are people who are never going to forgive you for the shit that you did in the way that you were inappropriate and it's not their job to have to forgive you because that has everything to do with them and nothing to do with you what you have to do is actually take action to the lessons that you learn that and is the ownership that you have and to make do. sure that you never affect anyone like that ever again yeah yeah exactly never make it so that there's another person walking this earth who is so pissed at you that they cannot forgive that hurt because you were just so damn ignorant you know what i mean it is that ownership and it's understanding that let me say something that lesson i learned let me tell you it, it's so interesting because i didn't i didn't even get to be called out i just had to see it i had to be i had to have learned everything i've learned from the age of i think i was uh 16 like from 16 to now a 29 year old woman and i had to see it with my 29 year old woman eyes and not the eyes of the 16 year old who was just doing it because they missed their friend and they wanted to perform the favorite part of the clip of the art that their friend made that they appreciated even if there's innocence in that there's problem in that and, the, and my eyes need to see it for what it is so i encourage folks that as things start coming up when you get called out look at it with your fresh eyes and your new knowledge because your gut's going to respond with the defense of like oh, oh but this is what i meant that's going to come up and that's okay that that comes up but make sure that you handle that on your own and that you're not using that to counter the person who is trying to teach you in the moment. Make sure that you are listening in that moment um, and really looking at it with fresh eyes. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Wow. Yeah. Oh, well, Oof. I feel like we've covered a you lot. You said it all. De todo. De todo. I yes. feel like we have to have a reunion like you and I. We, we should. Must, we, we should. should I thought we could talk forever, bitch. Right. <laughs> Listen, I hear Miami's more opened up than New York. I'm tempted. <laughs> Bang, fuck out.
<laughs> I'm tempted. I have familia. I have a cousin down there, so I'm low key tempted to just be like, well, come let me through. Speak. If you come through, please let me know. I would love to see you. I would absolutely, absolutely love to hang out in person absolutely. and build and plot and undo together. Yes, as undo together. And thanks for everyone who was listening. Like, we were real passionate and stuff. But these are the conversations that we need to be having. Do not be afraid to have these conversations. If you guys ever have questions on how to handle this, there's several resources. Um, I, on my platform, my podcast, at Ladies Who Bronche, um, we are trying to really put these conversations forward and, and have moments like these. So if you're really interested in, like, continuing these conversations or listening in um, in these conversations, Follow, follow your, your, you know, your black content creators. We are Amen. Talking, we're, follow we're talking Lisa. about our lives. Yeah, and we're talking about our lives. Like, really, what we're putting forth is a truth experience, not just the cool movie that someone's going to write that's, uh, you know, based on a true story. Hear the true story. Like, really show up for, for the moments that people are creating to, to share with you the information you need to, to get woke, for lack of a better word. So... And hold us accountable, you know, and hold us accountable to what we're sharing and, and how they're problematic. It's an on ongoing dialogue for us all. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yes. All right. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Julissa. Thank, Thank you. you for coming on and for taking the time today. I really appreciate you and just yes. like your perspective and your voice. You're just so brilliant. Thank you. So. Thank you. Thank you for sharing the space. I really appreciate it.